staff assignment was the Chief of Staff, Marine Forces Cyber Command. He is a graduate of Command and Staff College, Amphibious Warfare School, Airborne School, Naval Senior Officer Legal Course, and the Recruiting Management Course. He has also earned a Master's of Science in Resource Strategy at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, a Master's of Science from Duquesne University in Organizational Leadership, and is a graduate of Harvard Business School's Advanced Management Program. If you have any questions for the general, please text those to the address located on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for this morning's guest speaker, Brigadier General Clearfield, Deputy Commander, U.S. Marine Forces Pacific. Aloha. Data is important. Any questions? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I would really like to thank the Armed Forces Communication and Electronics Association, both international and Hawaii. Uh, General Lawrence, ma'am, thank you. And, uh, and Mr. Wiggins, thank you very much for, for hosting this. A quick round of applause for their leadership, please. <laughs> so this morning, we'll talk quickly about, uh, I, 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 I think this is about 15 to 20 minutes, and then please, I, I'd like to answer any questions you may have. But talk a little bit about the stand-in force, um, how we see that being networked, the importance of data, how, how what we need from a tactical, really, all the way up to a strategic level, and uh, uh, how these things are interlinked, and how perhaps industry could help us get better. Uh, as what we see to be an incredibly important domain and function of warfare. So stand-in forces, and behind me you can kind of see a map, that's the laydown of Marine Forces Pacific. Um, so when we say stand-in, what we're talking about is we are together forward with allies and partners as part of the joint force, and no matter what happens, we aren't going anywhere. So this is ubiquitous, it's a global concept for how the Marine Corps is going to fight in the future or fight tonight if needed to. Uh, but what you can kind of see f for me in my current job, this is what General Rudder uh, and Admiral Paparo, this is what we're most concerned with. So from a stand-in perspective, the ability to support allies and partners in the first island chain, we like to talk about the hard part happened in 1945 uh, with a very bu brutal battle for, for Okinawa. Um, you know, and now, we're, now we've got partners and allies throughout the region in both the first and the second island chain. So standing forces are mobile, maintainable, sustainable, combat lethal units that operate across the competition continuum within a contested area. It's operationally postured to support maritime defense in depth and support the joint force commander. And they are specifically tasked with disrupting the plans of a potential or actual adversary. Operational posture is the combat formation's preparedness to respond to a crisis, rapidly project power, sustain itself, and fight to accomplish the mission, while assuring our allies and partners and deterring adversaries. A unit's capability, capacity, availability, and, all, and readiness all determine its operational posture. They are designed to persist forward along allies and partners within a contested area, providing the fleet, the joint force, and those allies and partners options for countering an adversary's strategy. You, I think you heard Admiral Paparo talk yesterday about deterrence by denial. Um, Admiral Aquilino has testified uh, about this uh, concept as well. So, Situation dependent, stand-in forces are comprised of all elements of the joint force, the interagency, and our allies and partners. This is part of this deterrence piece. We're already there, we're already capable, we already have our kit, we're ready and we're prepared. So stand-in forces are designed to win the all-domain reconnaissance battle, the fight for information, to identify and confront adversary malign behavior directed at US allies and partners, and to develop understanding of the environment and adversary capabilities. They're designed to win the all-domain counter-reconnaissance battle to protect our partners and joint forces' freedom of maneuver while disrupting any adversary attempts to gain the initiative. So when we talk about 
the dominance of data in this new fight, I would just like you to consider for, ex for a second a Marine in garrison with their cyber persona. So they have this online presence. They use it to do administrative tasks. They use it to train. They use it to get certified. They use it really to do their job. Think about a Marine communicator in garrison in charge of maintaining uh, what we would call green gear radios uh, for other formations. That same Marine now is getting ready to go from a competition to a crisis or maybe even into conflict. So he or she moves then to a ship or to an aircraft and they move into position to support this great big coalition fight or this potential coalition fight. So think of the Marine and their data right now as a sensor, uh, possibly a shooter, certainly a receiver, certainly a transmitter, and they're, they're a connector and a transporter of this data. All these transitions, all these layers, all this data, who's gonna win that battle uh, with an adversary doing likewise things? The sensing, the make sense, and then acting on that Marine in their various roles. So if you can solve that for us, it would be much appreciated. And, and what, I, what I would just say is that I, I think sometimes there's a, there's a gap between what is technologically possible and then the realities of operational and tactical security. So what I would say is sadly, what we don't want is that Marine to have cookies tracking them everywhere they go. That, that's not the answer, unfortunately, I think for, for, for all of us. Um, now, if you wanna sell something to our adversaries that allows us to this was supposed to be funny. But anyway, that would, be, that would be great. So in the event of an armed conflict, standing forces remain forward in a contested area alongside our partners to support the naval and joint campaigns. We're there at all points of the competition continuum, and we disrupt adversary plans. I'd like to direct your attention to the screen so we can show you a quick example of what the standing force is and should be ready and will be ready to do. This is a short video from last August's uh, large-scale exercise you'll get a glimpse of what went into a ship sinking that was the capstone event of that exercise.
So if all you saw in that video was data moving around the battlefield, then you're who we need thinking about the future of warfare, uh, and I'm glad they let you out of the nerdery for this conference. So here's the question to answer is, if you saw the Marine fast roping out of that hellhole in the aircraft, uh, how do we get that Marine to enable future iterations of the Naval Strike Missile and our fourth and fifth generation aircraft to strike a moving surface combatant, an inbound enemy aircraft, or an inbound enemy missile? So I'm sure many of you have heard that our Corps is currently undergoing some major changes that have come out of Marine Corps Commandant General Berger's Force Design 2030 plan. That the Marine Corps is pursuing, pursuing a modernization effort should come as no surprise. After all, it's been 247 years of our history. We've always been on the leading edge of our nation's forward deployed forces. We're called first to fight for good reason. We've been directed and ordered by law to be the most ready when the nation is the least. We Marines have also embraced truly difficult operational problems and come up with solutions no one thought possible. It's what we're known for. And in fact, I would pause here, I'd be remiss. There's a few Marines, uh, both former, uh, former Marines present here today uh, and, uh, and current Marines that really made a lot of the technology and a lot of the passing of the transport layer that you saw uh, and some of the systems, uh, they, were, they were instrumental. So uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you all for that. Um, you did a great job, George. You can buy me a beer later on today for, for your hard work. I appreciate it. But the world we live in is ever-changing, as are the threats our nation faces. Today's environment is characterized by the proliferation of sophisticated sensors and precision weapons coupled with growing strategic competition. Our adversaries employ systems and tactics to hold the fleet and the larger joint force at arm's length. This allows these adversaries to employ a strategy that uses contested areas as a shield under which they can then apply a range of coercive measures short of war against our allies and partners. This is true nowhere more than here in Indo-Pacific. While the concept is applicable globally, the Indo-PACOM area of responsibility is appropriately the focus of the stand in force concept. And again, I would reorient you to the map that's currently showing up on the screen. So if you could with me for a second, uh, if you would bear with me just for a sort of personal story. So in 2018, uh, I had been in the Marine Corps for about 25 years. Uh, I'm an infantry officer by MOS. And I arrived at Fort Meade for, uh, at Marine Forces Cyber Command, where I was to be the G3 operations officer. So as I reflected back on that first year that I was at Mar4 Cyber, and again, I've got some colleagues present today, and it's good to see you. And uh, it's, it's uh, just for those back at the fort, you know, you will survive, right? You will, you will live. But what occurred to me is, if you were to go back in time to 1915, so if I were to put myself into a time machine and, and go back, uh, I guess I would have been probably, I'd like to think, maybe I would have joined in 18, you know, the armed services in 1890. And let's just say I was pretty good, so I became a, a cavalry officer. So it's 1915, and I roll up uh, on my horse. Uh, I suppose I got a pistol and a saber with me. And I see off to the background, somebody using this, a wireless communication to talk to somebody else. And then an aircraft flies over my head. And over to the side, I can see cars that have been armored and weaponized. And then out in the harbor, there's a no kidding submarine, something that can submerge itself and go underwater. I would like to think that my thought at that time would be, geez, I'm not sure two infantry regiments forward and one cavalry regiment back is gonna work against this new thing. Uh, I think that that's where we are right now, and a lot of that is because of the advances in computing power. So stand-in forces will need to work successfully in a dynamic operating environment, regardless of location. Marines should expect the environment they have to following general circumstances. I guess my vignette there was a way of saying, we can't afford not to change. I believe that's the way the majority of the Marines feel about Force Design 2030. We have to change, we can't stay the same. So one of the reasons for that is first is the prolifer proliferation of precision strike regime or an enterprise. 
Across the globe, actors at every level, including non-state actors, are demonstrating the ability to accurately sense the battlefield in multiple domains and rapidly strike. The continual improvement taking place in intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and targeting, created by the trend of rapidly increasing community computing power, is constantly dropping in cost and, and commercial availability the, these fundamental characteristics enabling them to conduct precision strike. This accelerates the proliferation while leading to ISR parity, particularly among nation state competitors. The implications of this are growing parity are many and probably what have me the most concerned. Among the most important things for a stand in force concept is that the ISR parity places a premium on having accurate maritime domain awareness at each point on the competition continuum. It also increases the importance of being able to control and mask one's signature and perform effective dissection in all domains if one desires to operate from within a contested area. We need to be heavily engaged in the signature management, this sense counter sense, recon counter recon fight. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there have long been doctrinal publications amongst the military about patrolling and anti-patrolling, scouting and anti-scouting, almost among every single service. We are now in what we would consider, because it's all domain, we call it reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance. So the objective, the objective could be not to avoid detection, but rather to avoid characterization. So we need to raise the noise floor with electronic magnetic spectrum and operate below its threshold. We need to avoid breaking squelch unless it, is, unless it is advantageous to our concept of operations. You can call it tactical deception, you can call it force protection, but risk-worthy platforms and decoy emitters all come into play. To this end, we need to maximize the use of easily available commercial technologies. I would say what we need, particularly in the stand-in force, is to become very data savvy. We need the ability to raise our signature or go dark. I think with some training and practicing of new habits of thought and new habits of action, the stand in force can become excellent at managing and manipulating our signatures, visual, noise, social media, data, and all the waveforms, SATCOM, UHF, HF, UHF. So the rapid changes in the global security environment are presenting significant new challenges to the U.S. military and, our abil and the ability of the joint force to seize, maintain, and protect our information and decision advantage over our adversaries. In addition, we must anticipate that future military operations will be conducted in degraded or contested electromagnetic spectrum environments. These challenges require a coherent and focused departmental effort to modernize how we develop, implement, and manage our C2 capabilities to prevail in all operational domains across echelons and with our mission partners. So the war fighting capability to sense, make sense, and act at all levels and phases of war across all domains and with all partners to deliver information advantage at speed of relevance. So briefly here as I conclude, when we talk about sensing, what we mean is the integration of information across all domains and the spectrum. Steady increases the amount of data and information in all domains require implementation of advanced sensing methods and information management technologies to enable improved information collection in the operational environment. An information sensor ecosystem exploits, exploits remote sensors, intelligence assets, and open sources to sense and simultaneously integrate information from and within all domains to enable the joint force commander to achieve information and, again, decision advantage. Sense and integrate is the ability to discover, collect, correlate, aggregate, process, and exploit data from all domains and sources, friendly, adversary, neutral and share the information as a basis for understanding and decision making. When we say make sense, we mean understanding the operational environment. It refers to analyzing information to better understand and predict the operational environment and the actions and intentions of an adversary, as well as the actions of our own and friendly forces. It is in sense making that data transforms into information and information transforms into knowledge. Effective sense making requires the ability to fuse, analyze, and render validated data and information from all domains and from across the spectrum. This function must execute within a secured information environment while remaining readily accessible to all authorized personnel, 
Ultimately, it must result in the reliable and sustained real-time understanding of the operation environment shared across the joint force and with partners. ACT is to make and disseminate decisions to the joint force and its mission partners. It combines the human elements of decision making with the technical means to perceive, understand, and predict the actions and intentions of the adversaries and take action. This includes accounting for the nuances of how a decision is delivered, how well the commander's direction is understood and executed. Planning the decision support applications will be employed across the joint force and underpinned by advanced, resilient, and redundant communication system. An access an accessible and comprehensive transport layer and flexible data formats, all of which ensure rapid, accurate, and secure dissemination of decisions. The use of an enterprise-wide, holistic approach for implementing material and non-material command and control capabilities is urgently needed to ensure the Joint Force Commander's ability to gain and maintain information against global adversaries throughout the competition continuum. The Marine Air Ground Task Force is being constructed to fight and win. It's purposely oriented on complementary engagement with the Joint Force, allies, and partners. So it must have interoperability across all systems and services, but also across policies, directives, and tactics, techniques, and procedures. When it comes to understanding the requirements for the stand-in force, working with allies and partners cannot be overstated. It is the key to determining the adversary's plans and is the primary reason the stand-in force presence must be persistent in day-to-day -day activity. The stand-in force will need to deter potential adversaries by establishing the forward edge of a partnered maritime defense in depth that denies the adversary freedom of action. Stand-in forces also deter by integrating activities with other elements of national power to impose costs on rivals who want to use ways and means below the violent threshold to achieve their goals. Stand-in forces support sea denial through the application of both organic sensors and weapons, and by integrating naval and joint sensors and weapons. Adversary actions to degrade, disrupt, deny space, cyber, and EMS operations in the contested environments are inevitable. Such operations will interfere with positioning, navigation, and timing, or PNT, and communication services will provide the fleet and joint forces. We talk a lot about data now, uh, we talk a lot about GPS, we talk a lot about precision. We don't talk often about PNT, uh, but for those in the audience, I wonder how many of you would have been able to get here today without PNT. This is supposed to be funny again too, but I guess, I guess it wasn't. I guess if you're staying in the hotel, you probably could have, you probably could have figured it out. No, never mind. Stand-in forces will need to be well positioned to mitigate such adversary actions. In the event of an adversary disrupts the receipt of global positioning satellite signals within a contested area, for example, stand-in forces can provide PNT services to adjacent fleet assets via surface or aerial systems. In a similar manner, similar manner, stand-in forces, primary alternate contingency and emergency comm, can also provide the fleet and joint forces alternate communication paths to overcome adversary interference. you could view the stand-in force as either one great big giant receiver or one great big giant transmitter, depending on what the adversary is doing to the advantage, so we can separate those things for the joint force. We will need to employ jam-resistant satellite comm capabilities, signal management capabilities, and the have ability to operate isolated for long durations of time. For this to work, we need redundant, reliable, and secure command and control capabilities in a denied, degraded environment that do not always require access to space-based assets. Stand-in forces impose costs to the enemy by presenting operationally relevant capabilities that cannot be ignored. Even as their low signature, highly mobile, dispersed, and deception make them difficult for an enemy to characterize and target. Their small footprint and focus on partnerships make the stand-in force less burdensome on host nation than perhaps larger U.S. formations. Signature management can be augmented by stand-in forces integrated with commercial communications, controlling what they emit in the electromagnetic spectrum by managing supplies and equipment. So how can industry help us with these challenges and needs? I suppose that's the million dollar question. <laughs> and it's time for you, the wizards of the technology center, to put your big brains to work and help us field capabilities that the stand-in forces will need for the force to and win. I'll leave you with one thought. The same technology that catapulted the world into the 21st century has fundamentally 
I believe, altered war's modern character. The speed, range, and conductivity of modern weapon systems enable belligerents to wage war on a global scale and across multiple domains. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time tackling these, chances, these challenges facing the stand-in force. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. We have time for about two or three questions. First one is up on the screen. Okay. As we have evolved our IT resilience, could you speak to how our OT slash IOT critical tactical infrastructure will be evolved to the same security posture as our IT information systems? I, no, I, I mean, I can't, yeah. I mean, well, look. Um, you know, Admiral Paparo's first question was like about the Villanova basketball team and, and you know, <laughs> guard dominate, you know, do you want guards to be able to play? You know, but, but honestly, uh, while I'm stalling, while, my, while you can see the smoke rising, um, I, 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 think, I think like a basketball team, the answer is um, it's, it's going to have to be. Uh, it's going to have to be, and 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 honestly, from an industry perspective, uh, we and I know the depart. There's a departmental effort underway on this, but but things need to be built. I would say. I would say the answer to your question is how will we do this? Uh, um, the criticality is that industry needs to produce things. That will that will be able to with security. I would say with a cyber or or a, you know uh, a transport layer security at the foremost of its thought. And then I think what complicates it though it needs to be able to talk to uh, other other things that other industry uh, other companies are are building. So we can't have platforms, hardware and software uh, that only work just for that just for that platform or just for that piece of hardware. It, ne it needs to be able to talk and shake hands in a secure manner with, with other things. And uh, sorry, I didn't know that. I, I, Paul, I think if, uh, I, there's some, plenty of people in here who can answer your question. I know, I know that for sure. But that's, that's probably my best, that's my best shot at it is that the only way we're going to get there is, it, is, is that if, if, if they come off of, uh, they come out of production with the, with the, the security in the hardware and its ability to connect to other other systems that we know it's going to need to be able to connect to, not necessarily from the same company. So Thank you, sir. The next question. Okay. If coalition is the overriding requirement, should we substantially increase our investment in robust, secure, scalable, resilient, and maneuverable coalition networks and apps ecosystems? And is this getting enough acquisition and fielding emphasis? You know, I, I will, you know, great question, great question. Absolutely vital, absolutely important. And I will tell you, it's a, it's a very big concern. There, there's not a month that goes by out here in the Indo-Pacific uh, that some member of the force out here, some, some uh, unit that is assigned and allo allocated to Indo-PACOM is not conducting an exercise uh, with an ally or partner in the region. And this comes up every time. Uh, the security, the, the, you know, the, the, the security and the classification uh, and, you know, the encryption uh, and how we do this. Um, I would defer to the acquisition professionals about how much attention this is getting. Um, this, isn't, this isn't currently what I'm, what I'm asked to do, but, this, but it's a concern and it's an issue. I, I would say a way for you all to Maybe this, is, maybe this is a gap until we get there with all our allies and partners. Um, but if we were able to get things in you know, the smallest form factor possible, I think what that would allow us to do, and I think what I've seen, what we do out here, what I've done operationally, and what I see the Marines doing often out here operationally is, they get instantiations of whatever uh, whatever network or app they need in the smallest waveform possible, the smallest instantiation, and then we actually place them in the ally or partner command post. Uh, and we ask the same. We have them bring 
uh, whatever their you know, modalities are in the smallest form pack possible, and they bring them into our command post. Now, probably not ideal, um, you know, probably not ideal, not the way probably business or industry will do it, but that's how we're, we're working around it. So I, I, I would say it's absolutely a major requirement. Um, security is the, at the foremost thought. They're back to really what I was saying in the middle of my speech, this is something that needs to be a, a major, major, as we're designing sort of our pace plans for how we're gonna do something, uh, this is a major factor involved. As far as the acquisition question, I'm, I, I, I'm probably not the one to, uh, to answer that. Thank you, sir. We have time for one more question. What is the status of moving Marine Unit or units to the old Barbers Point Naval Air Station here on Hawaii? Did the base commander just ask me? Did you just ask me? <laughs> I think we're just still, we're just still talking about it. Yeah. 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 So if you didn't hear, the base commander happens to be here, uh, who's uh, was lucky lucky for me. Uh, what, what basically what he said is it is something that we're considering, but it's in a holding pattern and probably four or five years away from it, any sort of decision. Yeah. I could take if there's another one. I'm I'm happy to take one. You want no? Okay. Thank you all very very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Joel Clearfield, thank you very much for those uh, enlightening remarks. Uh, it just goes to show you how kind of closely related the Navy and Marine Corps team are. Uh, the evolution of technology is beyond our comprehension. Uh, just a, a quick short story. I was the CEO of uh, the comm school. A couple of st former students are in the audience here. One of our exercises was we went to, we went to the, uh, the battlefield of Gettysburg and we had a semaphore exercise from Little Round Top down to Pennsylvania Memorial. Each of the two teams had to send, send a signal, a, sen a short sentence to each one uh, to demonstrate the capability of communications back in the, back in the Civil War days. Neither team knew uh, what they were sending, or, and so they had to actually come up with a correct answer if you're on the receiving side of the, uh, of the, of the event. But fast forward to where we are right now. I mean, it's absolutely incredible the warp speed that's going on here. That presentation uh, just showcases what the young men and women are doing out there in training. It used to be uh, physical fitness and mental fitness, and now it's technology fitness it has to be a part of all that, or we can't get the job done. So, sir, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I've got a coin for you. I'll bring it down to you. You don't have to come back up here. Thank you very much for that. With that said, uh, we, we recognize the warriors that didn't make it all the way through the, the war, uh, men and women. Uh, but there's another type of warrior that's out there. They're a wounded warrior. And we're going to make, FC is going to make a donation to the Friends of Windard, the Windward, uh, Wounded Warrior Organization as a, as a part of this overall event this week. Uh, and I want to, uh, this represents also the 36th uh, event uh, of, this, of this nature. I'm going to be followed by Linda Newton, who's got a, a couple things to share with you, and I want to thank you very much this morning. Good, good morning and aloha. I'm Linda Newton. I am the AFSIA Hawaii Chapter President, and we would like to call Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence to join us on stage. And I'm going to stretch this a little bit because we have one of the folks that we're going to recognize that's parking his car. So he is, we are happy to be able to present a few of our 2021 AFSIA International Awards to some of our AFSIA Hawaii members who were not able to join us last year at TechNet Cyber in Baltimore. So we're going to be able to do that today. And when we call your name, you can come up. Hi, good morning. I'm Ed Riglowitz, the uh, FCA International Regional Vice President, 
and uh, I represent Hawaii, Guam, and Alaska, and I'm a member of the local chapter here. But more than that, I had the privilege of being on the uh, selection committee as regional vice presidents. We do this and uh, do the selection. And uh, also, I was required to put an endorsement on each of these packages. And let me tell you, uh, I was very humbled by what I read on all these fine individuals. And I kept telling the, the local chapter, you guys and ladies are very, very talented, so keep putting in your words. And the Hawaii chapter has been very, very, very good in doing that and also, more than that, in also receiving these awards. So uh, again, like Linda said, we have a couple individuals that we'd like to recognize, and uh, I know each one of them, and I can attest to their wonderful and talented backgrounds, both for the volunteerism in, in the chapter and their technical and their leadership abilities. So if you could come forward at this time, uh, the Medal of Merit Award went to uh, Sanford Ching. Come on up, Sanford. Sanford had a lot to do with the, uh, the computer folks next door and ROTC and high school junior ROTC for the, the year, but Sanford's been a longstanding member of our, of our great chapter. Uh, next award is Meritorious Service Award, uh, Christine Lanning. Christine. Her and her husband own a company, and she does a tremendous amount of volunteer work with the, uh, the chapter and bringing and uh, mentoring younger people. Also, we have uh, an award we call the 40 Under 40 Award. It's for individuals that are under the age of 40 and uh, have accomplishments. But I didn't have a chance to have to endorse these, but when I looked at their packages later on, uh, didn't need my endorsement. They were just wonderful individuals. Brian Duenas, <laughs> Tech Sergeant Air Force. Sorry. And these people were pretty much recognized for all their technical abilities uh, in their job. Next individual is uh, Courtney Gallagher. Major Gallagher has been a stalwart participant in our chapter, and, a, and if you read her background and her job certification and stuff, she just knocks it out of the park. We also have uh, Mike Gresson, Tech Sergeant Air Force. Again, Mike, super individual, super credentials uh, with cyber information and operations. So, uh, again, another great performer. And that's all we have for this uh, morning. But these were our award winners from the 2021 time frame. And again, congratulations to each and every one of them. Thank you. We also uh, have a special presentation, and he doesn't know this is happening. I would like to ask Mr. Bob Ackerman to join me up on the stage. So Bob Ackerman has been the editor-in-chief of Signal Magazine for more than 20 years. Prior to becoming Signal's editor-in-chief, Bob served as the magazine's senior editor. He has been with Signal Magazine for more than three decades, during which he has written hundreds of feature articles and authored more than 400 columns and commentaries and attended most, if not all, of the TechNet events uh, in that APSEA International and the local chapter sponsor. As a seasoned technology journalist, Bob also served as a war correspondent covering the Iraq War embedded with the U.S. Army 101st Airborne Division. So we would like to present him with a small token of our appreciation 
from FCA Hawaii, and we are also giving you one of the proclamations that you can take that was signed by the governor. Thank you, General Clearfield, for your remarks. And just a couple of admin notes before we depart. At 9.30, Lieutenant General Robert Skinner, Director of DISA and Commander, Joint Forces Headquarters, Department of Defense Information Network, will be giving a keynote presentation in the South Pacific Ballroom, two through four. Tickets, tickets to this event, or excuse me, Tickets to this evening's Puhana event sponsored by Sienna and Lumen are still available for purchase at the registration desk. Please visit the Innovation Showcase location upstairs in the South Pacific Ballroom 1 and meet tomorrow's leaders in the future technologies and programs. Please refer to the AFCA 365 app for the, for the rest of today's events. And at 10 o'clock this morning, a panel discussion, a panel discussion, ooh, a panel discussion titled Magic MPE Assured C2, JAD C2, Enabling Security and Interoperability with Coalition Partners will be conducted in the South Pacific Ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. This concludes our morning breakfast event.